three. Welcome everyone uh, to the third In Touch With Experts Live series um, for May, where we celebrate Kangaroo Care Day on May 15. My name is Jamila Jackson and I am the founder of Kangaroo Care Day. And I also am the mom of a former pretty uh, macro family that now is 21 years old. And, uh, the sessions are for education, for conversation. Um, we, we are, um, today we have Dr. Dorothy Bittner. Dr. Dorothy Bittner is a, um, my friend and my mentor. Uh, I have met her, met her for over a decade probably because she does a lot of uh, research on kangaroo care. So that is my passion. So I, I was able to meet her. And she's also um, the president of the board. Is it president of the board of NICAP? Uh, vice president, yeah. Vice president of the board of NICAP. And I am a family, a family member of NICAP as well. So uh, please let me welcome uh, Dorothy Wittner and uh, Take it from here. Emila, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of my research, but I am so appreciative for all the work that you do to support infants and families and to bring awareness and to um, your passion to have it be different um, for the parents that um, have infants currently in newborn intensive care or other hospital settings. I think your work has really been inspirational and I'm super excited to talk with all of you who are here um, to hear a little bit about your experiences but also share a little bit about some of the work that I've done over the last few years. I have no commercial or financial disclosures. I am on the NIDCAP Federation International Board of Directors and I currently sit as the Vice President of that organization and also am a Senior NIDCAP Trainer and also an ENS trainer. So some of what we're hoping to accomplish today is to talk a little bit about some of the neurobiological mechanisms of skin to skin holding and really better understand some of the science around why this matters. Yet we really have a plethora of evidence to support skin to skin holding. Skin to skin holding is one of the most evidence based practices that we have in working with infants and families. And as we get started, a good friend of mine, John Chapel, who was a physical therapist by discipline, yet perhaps a philosopher at heart, would send me these handwritten notes of different topics that he thought I needed to be more aware of. And I thought this topic for today was especially fitting. Right? There is no subject so old that something new cannot be said about it. And for me, when I think about skin to skin holding, some of where my passion comes from is the missed opportunities, or if you will, or the inconsistencies in terms of parent and infant experiences. So I'd like for us to just kind of step back for a minute. And this image of Shana, who is a 33 year old young professional who um, had an infant who was born as a late preterm infant. And Cece was brought to the newborn intensive care unit um, because she was having some challenges with breathing. And yet the incredible missed opportunity, if you will, in terms of supporting that non-separation. And this image is when Shana first was able to hold Cece skin to skin. And so I'm gonna ask you just for a minute, how long do you think it took for Shana to be able to hold Cece skin to skin? So Cece was born back in 2019 Maybe in the chat, just kind of let me know what your thoughts are. Immediately, in the first couple of days, in the first week, in the first month. And it's kind of hard to see Cece in this picture. Um, we only really see the top of her head. But what we do see 
Yes, we see the look on Shana's face. So when do you think Shana held Cece for the first time? Everybody can unmute if you guys want to. Or you can put it in the chat. Or put it in the chat. Just kind of want to get a sense of what you all think. So people said first couple of days, uh, two days, 10 days. Yeah, so despite the fact that Cece was never on a ventilator, she never had an IV, yet was in the newborn intensive care for some breathing challenges, um, was being monitored, it took almost a week for Shana to be able to hold her skin to skin. And for me, the real missed opportunity, if you will. So a baby who is not on a ventilator, doesn't have an IV, is being monitored for breathing, yet also the missed opportunity of how we can use skin to skin to help stabilize and support some of those complexities and vulnerabilities that babies experience. So for me, thinking about creating some of these opportunities for non-separation, and when we talk about NIDCAP, so the Newborn Individualized Developmental Care and Assessment Program, or I talked a little bit about being on the NIDCAP Federation International. And NIDCAP is an approach to care that acknowledges the individualized needs of each infant and family and supports their developing relationship. So the essence of everything that we do is supporting that baby and family experience. So at the cornerstone of everything we do really is supporting that parent-infant relationship. And we know the evidence tells us that parent-infant relationships are difficult to establish when infants' parents confront challenges during that early postpartum period. And early parent-infant contact is really the cornerstone to that infant's health trajectory. In terms of thinking about that baby's growth and development, those very early relationships, those very early experiences really have quite an influence on that baby, on that family. Next slide. So when we go back to the evidence, right? and we go back to the literature, it tells us that parents of preterm infants often struggle with understanding the infant's subtle um, behavioral patterns, right? So some of those behaviors are really difficult to interpret. And what we know is there can be decrease in synchrony and um, a decrease in terms of how to respond to what behaviors the infant is showing us. And it can be really difficult to interpret what's the baby trying to accomplish. When we also look at the literature and we think about some of the work by Ruth Feldman and some of her colleagues, she's been looking at oxytocin and the influence of oxytocin on that parent-infant interaction. And some of what that literature with older infants, infants who are about four to six months of age, um, tells us is that mothers with higher levels of affectionate touch influence is influenced by the amount of oxytocin um, in both the infant and the parent. And when we think about this, one of my own mentors, Dr. Xiaomei Kong, looked at oxytocin levels for parents um, using skin to skin as a mechanism to activate oxytocin release. Next slide. So when we think about oxytocin, oxytocin is a neuropeptide that's produced in the supraoptic nucleus and periventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. And oxytocin is often described as the love hormone or that neuromodulator that plays an important role in terms of bond formation and parenting. And it's the organization of that oxytocin availability that's really critical to that limbic and neocortical system that is dependent on early life experiences. 
So neurobiologically, it's oxytocin, if you will, that directs that young infant to preferentially select species-specific social interactions and stimuli that help to form dyadic attachments. Next slide. So the power of oxytocin really is in its neuromodulator capacities, if you will, to facilitate that social sensitivity and attunement that's necessary to develop relationships, that's necessary to build nurturance. And this emerges as intellectual development as that infant grows. Next slide. So I also want to talk just a little bit about the um, hormone cortisol, which is often referred to as the stress hormone. And this is a hormone that I could probably talk this entire time about oxytocin or cortisol. And so some of my research has been around looking at oxytocin as that neuromodulator to support um, competence, to help support that infant um, to activate that parasympathetic nervous system. And thinking about cortisol in terms of the stress hormone and how that gets activated with that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access or the HPA access, which is a very eloquent and dynamic intertwining of that central nervous system and endocrine system. And one of the things that we know about stress and that we know about cortisol is that with repeated and prolonged stress exposure, our cortisol levels can be impacted by that. And so, for example, for individuals that have repeated and prolonged stress, they actually have a reduced cortisol response in terms of how they respond neurobiologically to that stressful event. Next slide. And so when we think about, let's go back to skin to skin holding or that skin to skin care. And the literature tells us that skin to skin holding activates endogenous oxytocin and also decreases salivary cortisol in mothers and fathers. And so when we think about this opportunity within early infancy, we think about it as a sensitive period of development for that HPA access or that co-regulatory response. And we think about it in terms of the sensitive period of development in which we have bond formation between parents and preterm infants. And the infant's brain is really sensitized to these reciprocal occurrences that are happening neurobiologically, physiologically, in collaboration with what behaviors we see from that infant. So for example, thinking about early and responsive synchronous contacts has positive influence on that infant's cognitive and neurodevelopmental outcomes. Next slide. If we can create opportunities to build nurturance and trust within these early life experiences, that baby has a very different um, biology, if you will, than the infant who doesn't experience um, nurturance and trust. So when we think about that baby's emotional development, emotional development, um, according to Erickson during infancy, is about trust versus mistrust. And how can we create opportunities to build trust in this critical period of development? Next slide. So some of my earlier research really looked at using skin to skin holding to see about those neurobiologic mechanisms. And I was interested to know, do infants from birth have the neurobiologic capacity to 
activate oxytocin release, or perhaps decrease cortisol, if you will? And does this influence that parent-infant relationship? So I looked at um, parental stress in terms of parental anxiety, um, perceptions of stress, and I also looked at dyadic interactions of how that parent interacted with the infant. So next slide. So what we found was, um, next slide, we saw significant um, relationships, if you will, for mothers and infants. Um, next slide. We saw significant relationships in terms of activating that oxytocin release during skin to skin holding. So for mothers that were holding their infants skin to skin, that oxytocin was activated for the mother, but also for the infant. Next slide. And what we saw after skin to skin holding was that oxytocin level, although um, not statistically significant from before caregiving, we saw elevated um, responses to that skin to skin holding. So when parents were holding their infants skin to skin, next slide, we saw decreases in um, cortisol levels. So we measured cortisol levels before caregiving. Next slide. During caregiving, we saw a decrease in those cortisol levels. And next slide. Um, I'm gonna have you um, click through just a couple more slides what we looked at here was the effect of skin to skin holding on oxytocin and cortisol levels so these figures are the same data that we just showed in um, kind of words we see that oxytocin was activated for both mothers fathers as well as for infants next slide during skin to skin holding. And what we also saw, if you go back to the last slide, uh, Yamil, what we saw was that infant cortisol levels were significantly decreased, whether that infant was held by the mother or held by the father. The baby had the same neurobiologic response um, to the skin to skin holding episode. Next slide. So we saw that parent and infants with increased oxytocin levels had more synchronicity and responsiveness in their interactions and rather significantly. So we also saw that there were some relationships that mothers with higher oxytocin levels had fathers with higher oxytocin levels, which was also consistent with some of the literature. Uh, next slide. So this study provided some evidence that skin to skin holding activates oxytocin release and decreases that salivary cortisol levels for both mothers, fathers, but also for infants. Next slide. And I'd ask us to consider a lot of my research was on um, healthy preterm infants that were born between uh, 30 weeks gestation and 36 weeks and six sevenths um, gestation. And yet I'd ask us to consider that even with younger, smaller infants, that we create opportunities for skin to skin holding, that we have a plethora of evidence. There have been systematic reviews, there have been meta-analyses that show 
that even for that very young small infant, there are benefits for that baby in terms of their brain growth, in terms of the time that they spend on the ventilator, as well as for um, the length of stay in the hospital. And yet, one of the things that is really important is supporting the healthcare professional in terms of the skills that it takes to be able to navigate all of those competing demands and all of that technology to do it safely. So some of the research that I've been doing recently has been about looking at some of that decision making for that healthcare professional to support family-centered care. Next slide. To think about how we can better support parents in terms of a self-management model, how we can support parents to be actively engaged in the care of their infants, and what can we do to support the acquisition of those skills that that parent needs in terms of navigating these different hospital systems. I think that um, if we think about the individual strengths that each infant and family brings, there are often opportunities for us to think about what are the priorities of that family and how can we better support them to be active participants in the care of their baby. Next slide. Some of the, um, we're gonna go to the next slide. Some of the research that I've done to look at parent engagement and to say, are there differences or what is it about parents participating in the care of their infant can influence their um, confidence and competence in providing that care. And what we found in this study was that parents who held their infant skin to skin were much more likely to be actively participating in the baby's care. Next slide. So we also wanted to look at, is there a relationship between oxytocin and parental engagement? Next slide. And what we found was, we saw that infants with higher oxytocin levels also had parents that were more actively engaged in their care. And so this really, really makes sense, right? So there's this neurobiologic process that's happening for the baby, for the parent, that influences that synchronicity and that connection and attunement. Next slide. So this is a paper that is actually under review right now, where we looked at, does oxytocin and cortisol make a difference for the infant's neurobehavioral competence. And the tool that we use to measure infant neurobehavioral functioning is the, network, the NICU Network Neurobehavioral Scale, or often referred to as the ENDS. Next slide. And the ENDS is a neurobehavioral assessment that looks at and thinks about all human experiences having psychological, biological, and an organic context that dynamically influence each other in mutuality with the environment. So the ENDS is some 115 items that can be clustered into about 13 summary scores. And we know that the ENDS is correlated to predictive reliabilities in terms of helping us to identify infants who are most at risk for neurodevelopmental delays. Next slide. And some of what we found with some of this work was that infants who had higher oxytocin levels were significantly correlated to higher self-regulatory scores. And so what that means is that babies with higher oxytocin levels were more competent in terms of meeting their own needs of 
self-regulatory behavior. And when we think about self-regulatory behavior, that could be anything from sucking on their hands. It could be self-regulatory behavior in terms of opening your eyes and interacting with um, people who are talking with you. We also saw that when an infant had a lower cortisol level, that they needed less support in terms of those handling scores. So there was a strong correlation, if you will, to infants with lower salivary cortisol levels needing less support from that um, person who was interacting with them. Next slide. Uh, we're going to go to the next slide. We also saw that those salivary cortisol levels were strongly correlated to increased stress behaviors and also increased behavioral disorganization with infants. Next slide. So research suggests that as preterm infants mature, they remain increasingly disadvantaged on many neurodevelopmental outcomes. And it's that increased acuity and complexity of care within the newborn intensive care that creates challenges for healthcare professionals who are attempting to navigate some of these competing demands. Next slide. So the opportunity is within that parental touch. And we know that skin to skin contact is a very different sensory experience in terms of the way that that parent feels, the way that that parent smells, the way that that parent um, sounds to that infant. That infant can hear the heartbeat through the parent's chest. And we know that skin-to-skin -skin contact has the potential to reduce some of the adverse consequences of prematurity. We have um, evidence to support this. Next slide. So it's throughout the lifespan that that oxytocin helps us to modulate that social sensitivity and it helps us to modulate some of our reactivity to stress. And we know that infants that have higher oxytocin levels, um, the oxytocin helps to activate that parasympathetic nervous system to help that baby cope with some of those stressful experiences. And we know that when we provide opportunities for skin to skin holding within this critical window, we can provide opportunities for nurturance and reciprocal trust that we don't need to tell parents how to interact with their infants when their infants um, are being held skin to skin. I know that when I work in the clinical setting and even I was working on Sunday afternoon and um, a parent was holding their premature baby for the first time skin to skin and they were ever so reciprocal in terms of that caressing, that touching, that supporting that infant in terms of steadying out that breathing. And as a healthcare professional and as a nurse, I didn't necessarily need to teach them how to do that. They just needed to trust themselves and trust the baby. And it's these neurobiologic processes that are happening that help to support some of these reciprocal interactions. Next slide. So despite some of the advances in newborn intensive care, premature infants still remain at risk for adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes. And we really can use skin to skin to help support some of this neurobehavioral functioning. So I pose to all of you to think about using skin to skin each and every day that you go into the nursery as an intervention to better support that infant in terms of their competence to help steady out that breathing. So if the baby's having a bad day, maybe we encourage skin to skin holding instead of using skin to skin holding as um, for only stable or healthy babies. Next slide. 
So when we go back to the literature, I think this is really important because we have evidence to say this is a systematic review that looked at the late preterm and early term infant. And it really helped us to understand that these infants who are born late preterm really are at a risk for poorer outcomes that persist into adulthood. Next slide. So even with these infants that we would consider to do well, um, the babies are at risk for neurodevelopmental deficits. And so do infants that are born late preterm or early term, um, do they have opportunities for skin to skin holding as well? And that goes back to next slide, that image that I showed you where we started out the presentation in um, the missed opportunity, if you will, for these infants who come into the newborn intensive care and may not be the sickest infant in the unit, and yet they still miss those opportunities for skin to skin holding. Next slide. And it's that executive functioning or the way that that frontal lobe works in the brain that really helps us to understand some of these neurodevelopmental delays. Next slide. So I'm going to ask you to consider that all infants, irregardless of their medical complexity, so whether they have complex heart disease, whether they have prematurity, um, whether they're born full term, whether they're born early, that they have repeated and daily episodes of skin to skin holding. Next slide. I think um, some of my earlier research around trying to understand nurses' experiences in supporting skin to skin holding. And I think one of the things that I learned early in my career was that nurses have good intentions to support skin to skin holding, yet often struggle to meet those competing demands to use skin to skin holding in each and every day. And some of this meta ethnography, some of what we found was that it really depended on the complexity of the infant or supporting the safety and efficacy of whatever technology that infant needed with the competing demands of um, supporting parents and supporting um, infant experiences. Next slide. So this is a group of nurses over at Wake Med um, Health Systems over in Raleigh, North Carolina. And just that whole experience about supporting um, families to be actively participating in the care of their infant. And this is an image of an infant um, on the day of discharge and he was leaving the unit and you see that investment in those healthcare professionals, those nurses in that parents experience. I'm going to encourage you that what you think gets translated into your hands, how you um, Think about what you should do, what your choices are. Um, each and every time that you go into the into the work makes a difference for this baby and family. Next slide. And I want you to know that it makes a difference for not only the baby, but also for the family. And so this is a picture of Jordan, who was born at full term, but had some medical complexities and was in the intensive care unit for many, many weeks and really struggled with um, uh, feeding, struggled with um, state regulation, and yet how we support families to be active participants um, with the care of their infant. This was Jordan when she came back to the follow-up clinic um, for her nine-month follow-up visit. So it makes a difference. What you do, how you do it makes a difference. And I'm hoping that we can open up the conversation. Um, and I appreciate your patience with some of the technology glitches, but I think we hopefully worked it out and didn't go too far over. Um, 
If you have any questions, any nitty gritty questions, I'm happy to answer those questions now. I'm also happy to share any of this information with any of you um, later if you have more specific questions. So I'm gonna just open up the floor for questions and discussions. Thank you so much, Dorothy. This was amazing. Uh, as a mom that uh, held Zachary when he was uh, a micro preemie and my husband too, I, I definitely, you know, this, this obviously the science was not there, but uh, my intuition was right that, you know, parents can do so much for their, for their babies. So uh, any questions of anybody? Does anybody want to? I think also too, when we think about some of how I met Yamil was around um, <laughs> nurtured, her work with Nurtured by Design. And um, in my research, um, we used the Zaki as a, as a tool, as an intervention to help support some of that safety um, for the infant. And so one of the really great things about the Zaki is its ability to secure different medical tubing, medical devices in a very um, purposeful way um to because it is really complicated and these babies are really really vulnerable and what you do does make a difference and so i'm not advocating that we be willy-nilly about it but i do think we can be much more proactive in terms of incorporating it into our daily plan of care for all infants and also supporting nurses with that education supporting nurses with um different strategies, if you will, in terms of taking the baby out of the incubator, using the parent's body as a mechanism to support some of that self-regulation for the infant. Thank you. Uh, Sue, you have a question? Yeah, um, Dorothy, in your research, did you look at the extremely low birth weight? I'm talking kids under 1,200 grams because um, that's come up. I'm working with the Florida Perinatal um, Quality Collaborative right now, and we are actually doing what we're calling the Paired Initiative, and it's for family-centered care, and our measurement is actually skin to skin. And one of the issues we're having is, um, A, um, you know, the, the 72 hours midline for the tiny babies to protect um, their, their brain, and then two, a lot of the nurses are really, um, they're really concerned in terms of some of the unintended consequences, um, i.e. lines and um, ventilators. Um, and we struggle with trying to say, look, there's nothing in the research that supports that they can't be, you know, with mom or dad or a caregiver. And I'm, I'm just wondering, did you find any of that with your research and how did you approach it? Yeah, so you're bringing up really great questions. And we actually, there's a couple of papers that have just come out um, recently looking at this um, specifically. And I have worked as an infant developmental specialist for the last 30 years in newborn intensive care, as well as in the pediatric intensive care unit. And thinking about the incredible amount of training that it takes to support nurses and clinicians to be able to practice some of this is not trivial um, because there is a lot of technology and you do have to assure that the lines are secure, that the baby is intubated because it does not go well if the baby extubates during that opportunity for skin to skin holding. And so I showed you a picture of a group of nurses from wake med and in my time in working at wake med it was inspiring that they had as a part of their quality initiatives that they support skin to skin holding within 24 hours for all infants and then they took that quality initiative one step further and said we want to have and encourage and support skin to skin holding 
within that first eight hours um, for even very young, very small, very um, sick infants. And so I think there is beginning to be some literature out there but Sue, what you're really talking about is that kind of practical application piece of how do we support the healthcare team to translate some of this content into, into clinical practice. And there are some interventions that um, can help with this, but I think we also need to acknowledge that we have to integrate this into our nursing competencies, we have to integrate this into our nursing education, into our orientation processes of sometimes it takes two, three, four nurses, a respiratory therapist, other clinicians at the bedside to be able to safely um, transfer that young small infant to that parent's chest and it's not trivial. Does Thank that answer you. your question at yeah, all, it, Sue? It, it did. Thank you very much. We we actually have started um, using, I don't know if you've seen it, but Mary Coughlin in her evidence-based um, book <laughs> um, actually has competencies uh, both for the parents and the staff um, for transfers of the infant to skin-to-skin -skin care. And so we're, we've started, we've talked to her and we're looking at using those now with some of our, um, some of the hospitals are using that. And, our, and I'm glad you mentioned respiratory therapists because we're, we're now working to get them on board because we found that some of our biggest obstacles within the initiative have been respiratory therapists, um, getting them on board because they're the ones who are so afraid of the extubation piece. Oh, absolutely. And it's terrifying for parents, right? So mm -hmm. I think of, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was working in the nursery and a baby was born at 34 weeks. And so we all would think, wow, this is a really big baby. He's about, you know, uh, three and a half, four pounds. He's doing really well. He might be on a little bit of CPAP. But to that parent, that baby is terrifying. That experience is terrifying. And so it's really about supporting your staff to be able to have those conversations and provide that um envelope of okay i know it's really scary but we're going to do this together and we're going to mm -hmm. make sure that the baby's okay and that you're okay and mm -hmm. trust me to trust you mm -hmm. and so um i think those conversations are really important and i think it's really important for us to give uh, nurses and healthcare professionals at the bedside language to be able to have that conversation but mm -hmm. also to be able to be supported to support parents um, because invariably after that first time that goes well, you don't have to, um, uh, the second time the parent really is a little bit more proactive about yeah. doing it. And so some of my research in terms of looking at the healthcare professional the, or the nurse's experience really got at that because you can't force people um, if they're really, really scared and um, are worried about um, different things and they're holding their baby in their shoulders or above their ears and they're just terrified, that's a very different experience than um, a parent who's kind of proactively advocating, I really, really want to hold the infant. I think most parents want what's best for their baby. Most parents, um, uh, I'll say, want their baby to do well. So when the when it's all going well, that's good. But when it's when it's not, and it can be really challenging, that's when um, it's important to be come from a mutually supportive um, framework, if you will. Uh, and I will tell you, one of the things we did look at, and we're looking at with our um, statistics, is we are looking at unintended con um, consequences. Um, and it's interesting because with the numbers that we have, we've never seen over 2% of an unintended consequence. And most of our unintended consequences are apnea, bradycardia, um, and desaturations. And then that's an education to the staff of that may be expected when you first transfer and getting the baby back to baseline. So I, I really appreciate this research because I think it's going to be really helpful for a lot of us.
Yeah, and I think that's really important in terms of the posture, right? So where is that neck in alignment to the rest of the body? And how can we use that breast as a um, positioning device, if you will, to support that baby to have a neutral airway that's um, supported rather than that chin being all the way over to the shoulder or um, other kind of hemodynamic um, complexities because infants that are born early and young or are critically ill, their autonomic thresholds are very thin. And so it very quickly can be a life um, altering event with either apnea or bradycardia. Um, and we really have to assure that we do this um, safely, if you will, and we we attend to all of that. So I advocate for some of this work in the NICU. I advocate for this work in the cardiac intensive care unit. So thinking about how we can humanize care, if you will, right? So thinking about the human effect of who is this baby as a person and how can we support their experience experiences to build trust, irregardless of the technology that they need for those various disease processes. So it's complicated, but it's also really possible. Yeah, thank if you. I can, thank you, Sue. Uh, if, <clears throat> if I can tell you my experience as a mom that held a micropremie, uh, I, you know, we are terrified of, you know, of, of holding a baby and maybe that something will happen when we are when we are holding. And what my research showed is exactly what uh, we're talking about is, you know, what is, how do we ensure that the baby is going to be safe? Uh, we know that the moms are uh, sleep deprived. We are terrified. Um, we want to hold our babies, but if we feel, or somebody tells us that by holding, we're going to hurt the baby, then we're not going to hold the baby, obviously. Another thing that I found was when the babies, <clears throat> when the babies are on the bed, the nurse has complete control or as much control as possible of this baby um, and the safety um, and the responsibility. But when this baby goes to the chest of a parent, they have to give the control to someone else. And that someone else, like I said, is you know, sleep deprived, we're terrified. So that's why I made the Zaki Sack that Dorothy mentioned before, is to get the, the moms you know, they, to hold that device that will hold the weight of the baby, that will hold the position of the baby, and will give that control back to the nurse, where the nurse makes sure that the baby's okay before she goes away and is not you know, terrified that the mom is gonna fall asleep in a split second and put this baby in danger. So um, <clears throat> does anybody else have a question or any comments or? Hi, yes, I would like to ask a question. My hi. name is Iris, I'm from Israel. And hi. I would like to, oh, no. hi. <laughs> I would like to ask about, I come from a developmental care oriented NICU. I'm a NICAP certified. Uh, and I would like to ask about your experience with uh, uh, skin to skin during the first three days of life of extremely low birth weight babies. Uh, our challenge is not respiratory therapists, not, uh, either not our willing, willingness to do it because the nurses and the physician are completely pro, but the, our main problem is uh, thermoregulation mm -hmm. and also umbilical arterial line and vein, vein lines. So this is my question. Yeah, so those are um, really important considerations. We know that the mother's breast, um, the evidence tells us that the mother's body and breast will warm up and will cool down to keep that baby at a constant temperature. That being said, how is the mother's um, temperature? What's the temperature of the room? How we think about um, humidity? All of that, um, because that baby's skin is really vulnerable in that critical window. So that's all really important considerations, if you will. I think being innovative, if you will, I think um, 
there are approaches that you can use to support um, that transfer of using that mother's body and breast um, as a mechanism to help steady that baby. Um, I think also to securing those lines, right? So in that transfer of picking the baby up, if the mother is right there at the incubator, if you will, or yeah, that, doing that kind of like warming table, um, and then we can have someone who's total responsibility is to assure that security of that line. And that's where I talked about sometimes it takes two, three, four clinicians. Um, in the unit that I'm thinking of, we would each, um, someone would have a responsibility for the ET tube, someone would have a responsibility for the line, someone would have a responsibility for the mother, and someone would have a responsibility for the baby to make sure that you know, the arms, the legs, the whole body is um, supported. All of this makes a difference. And it can be really complicated, but I'm telling you that it's actually um, really worth it. I think also too, what I've seen with healthcare teams is that when you have really good intentions, um, you figure out how to get it done. Um, I'll tell you in the un unit that I work now, it's really a priority that babies do not self extubate. Babies don't extubate during skin to skin holding. You know, sometimes we struggle if a baby's on a certain ventilator that the, the circuit is really rigid and it's only a certain height. And then we don't have, you know, the mother has to come up to that height, or do we have chairs that are appropriate and comfortable for her to recline in? If we have a mom who's had a cesarean, is what what's her mobility like? Is she able to move? How what's her own process that's happening? All of this is really complicated. It's not um, trivial. So I know that I've kind of said things at a superficial level, but it's also, it takes an incredible amount of thoughtfulness to be able to do it accurately and appropriately. And that's what I'm advocating for. So I appreciate your question, Iris. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Iris. Anybody else? So I see in the chat that someone also said, we do a timeout with skin to skin transfers. Um, and we do standing transfers as much as possible, which I think are both incredibly um, thoughtful and great ideas and would be really in support of all that. What is a timeout? So a timeout is just a pause and checking in the right baby, um, the right procedure uh, at the right time with all of the right equipment. And we're proactive in terms of doing that um, to be sure that we're all on the same page in what we're trying to accomplish. So I know in our hospital, we do timeouts before we do different medical procedures, um, but we do not do it for a skin to skin transfer, which would actually be, I think it's a great idea. Is that what you meant, Shock? Sorry if I have little babies around me. Yes, um, we act, you can call it a huddle if you like. Everybody gets assigned a role and everybody's in agreement. And we it, and the parent is involved as well in this uh, timeout huddle moment before we actually do. And everything is agreed upon before we actually move the baby with mom and, it, and dad. And I think I totally said your name wrong. Is it Jackie? Oh. Yes, it is. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much for your input. We are right in the middle of trying to make improvements with kangaroo care in our big unit. And uh, we struggle with all the things that you're talking about. Actually, our small babies are the ones that get held most and our very stable growing babies, they get, you know, swaddle help or whatever. So yeah, they once babies get dressed, we forget about um, using skin to skin, right? It's a real um, challenge in many units. Um, I also just wanted to put a plug out there. I'm currently doing a research project 
um, looking at nurses' experiences um, in the newborn intensive care unit, um, supporting families. So if you're interested in participating in a qualitative um, research study, please reach out to me. I would love to talk to you. It's just about learning about your um, experiences supporting babies and families. And we can put that information in the resource page that we're going to put the video on as well. So Great, great. So Dorothy, another question that I that it's very frequently asked uh, is how long can a baby be kangarooed? And you know, like sometimes it's like, well, you already did one hour in the morning, so you cannot, we can't do anymore. Or the mom holds in the morning, so the dad cannot hold at night. Or you know, the baby mom is holding, she needs to go to the restroom, the baby goes back, and then they say no more, no more kangaroo care for the day. What 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 is your suggestion and your research? So there's some um, units, there's some hospitals that the baby's held 20 to 24 hours a day. So from my perspective, the ideal incubator or the ideal environment for that baby is their mother's chest. That neurobiologically, that baby expects that mother's body and breast um, from birth. And so I think that as we think about this and also too, what's happening in Europe is very different than what's happening here in the US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in different parts of the world, we use skin to skin holding much more, right? So where did skin to skin holding come? It came from South America. Why? Because they didn't have enough incubators to be able to keep babies warm and their mortality rates were really high. And so I think the more the better. I don't think there's a magic number we have evidence, overwhelming evidence in terms of meta-analysis that were done 15 years ago. We also have meta-analyses that um, were done more recently that support um, repeated and prolonged skin-to-skin -skin holding for all infants. And I encourage parents, even when they go home from the hospital, to use skin to skin every day. So you're watching a movie, you're watching the baseball game, you're watching the football game, um, after dinner, before dinner, in the morning, whatever time it is that works for your rhythm, that each and every day babies experience skin to skin holding. And this is for all infants, not just young, small infants, but even healthy term infants. Yep. There's so much evidence to say it makes a difference for that baby's brain, for that baby's development that lasts into adulthood, actually. Mm -hmm. And Dorothy, it's interesting that, um, and, uh, that we brought this comment up because a couple of years ago at, um, before the pandemic shut everything down, Dr. White, was talking about um, if he was, you know, he's head of the design for the NICU for AAP. And one of the comments he made is that if he was designing a NICU now, he would put a kangaroo chair in the center of the space and everything else would be designed around it. Which I thought was, I mean, so I think that really speaks to that. Well, I think it's also um, sometimes we like technology and we like, um, we spend a lot of money on incubators. Um, I remember, gosh, 20 years ago, being shocked when an incubator cost $300,000 um, and all of the technology, which is absolutely understandable. And yet we underestimate if we only spent a fraction of that in supporting families and supporting parents to be that baby's incubator. Um, how how different um, outcomes would be. And I know that's kind of a rogue statement, but I, I think that it's, um, there's a lot of opportunities there. But we need to help them support the babies as well. Because it's hard, it's hard, I, I did it. Absolutely. And it's hard to keep straight. Uh, actually, Troa, Children's of Atlanta did a study of, you know, they want to do more. Yep more um, skin to skin for intubated babies. And so they started doing kangaroo care with intubated babies and then respiratory therapy said, hey, hold on, because there is a lot of uh, unplanned extubations. So they, um, you know, and they, uh, they called me and I said, you know, I asked when is the extubation happening? Because it depends where the extubation is happening, your indication uh, um, is, gonna, is gonna be. 
And we thought he was going to be during transfer. And it's actually 30 to 40 minutes after the babies were in skin to skin, which is how long a human can be like totally still. After that, you know, and I remember like, you know, moving my arms when I was holding Zachary and my shoulders. And so we want moms to be very comfortable and we give them comfortable chairs. And, but we tell them, you know, you need to be the position here, this here, the alignment here. Um, and then, um, you know, we want them to, to be still and naturally hold your baby. Um, and it, it's very hard. So that's, that's one of the reasons that I did this act of sack is because I know how hard it is. And I know the dangers that we, we make, you know, that, that we put the baby in danger when, when we go, you know, skin to skin. And we give really comfortable chairs to the moms. We're doing we're producing oxytocin. The adrenaline is down. We are sleep deprived, and so we're like, okay, we want you to be comfortable, but don't fall asleep because then we'll, we'll close kangaroo care. We'll, we'll finish kangaroo care. So, <clears throat> so it's really interesting you say that, and I think of my own experiences of working as a nurse. And you know, to be honest with you, there are times when that parent, that was the only time they actually fell asleep. And so okay. as a nurse, staying within an arm's length to assure that that baby was safe and what was happening and how they were secured. And so it's really interesting because it really depends on unit culture, if you will, Absolutely. in terms of is it okay or is it not okay um, for that parent to fall asleep, for that baby to fall asleep. Um, yeah. Well, we actually uh, have a paper that, that is published about the risk management of kinder care and, and holding babies because, you know, you you have your 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 mind taking care of the of the baby, but you also have your hand, and you both go away when the mom falls asleep. I fell asleep with Zach, and like you say, it was the best sleep that I ever had during the five months that Zach was in the NICU. So I wanted to prepare something that will make it safe for the parents to sleep. Um, but we don't recommend sleeping without somebody like, you know, taking care of the hands or the attention. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's definitely, that's my, my mission in, in, in life is, you know, keep the baby so safe that if the mom falls asleep, it's not going to put the baby in danger which is what happens if you don't have a device for that. Any other questions, comments, experiences, things that you have experienced at the hub? Skin to skin is a great number of Yes, skin to skin, there is uh, research that uh, is doing is being done by Dr. Cleveland in San Antonio. And they were doing skin to skin for NAS babies. And um, they asked moms, how do you feel? And, and it's so powerful. Like one of the moms said, I feel like my baby is forgiving me. Um, which you don't get that with any other intervention other than skin to skin. All right, anybody else? Gretchen says many, many thanks to Dorothy, an expert who is practically and incredibly forward thinking. I totally agree. <laughs> anybody else? All right, well, this concludes our uh, In Touch for ex uh, with Experts uh, with um, Dr. Dorothy Bittner. We will have the recording for the three sessions uh, next week. And, um, and we will have some resources of things that we have talked during the sessions. So uh, thank you. Thanks everyone for attending and I'm going to start the recording.